بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد after so many breaks that were unexpected uh, because of the cold front and whatnot inshallah we are finally alhamdulillah coming back I think after one month how long has it been uh, more than a month like one month one month four weeks break I think right we had so uh, the what Masha so it is a four week break now we're coming back after that. This is the fifth week, to be very pedantic about it. So, alhamdulillah. So, a four week break, as I said, alhamdulillah. Uh, and we are now resuming um, our uh, session. And uh, some people have suggested I should not call this seerah anymore. And this is a valid point because, of course, the seerah is now over. Nonetheless, uh, what we're discussing today is related to the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and it is of course the election of the uh, Khalifa Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu taala an. And as every single Muslim is very intimately aware, this is where the theological divide begins between Sunnism and Shiism. This is really where it all begins. So today's lecture is not just historical; it is also theological. Today's lecture is not just historical, it is also theological because uh, we believe, and this is a, the difference between Sunnism and Shiism, we believe that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu was the person who was the most suitable to be the Khalifa and this is a religious matter and not just a political matter and of course the other group disagrees with this. So the question arises and so today we're going to do a little bit about this issue. It's not going to be that detailed because this is not a class of Sunnism versus Shiism. And I'm not going to give you the Shi'i evidences, why not? That's a separate class. I have spoken about this in other seminars, not in this historical, but you cannot talk about the election of Abu Bakr without at least giving some indications of the theological differences as well. So the question that arises is, how was Abu Bakr as-Siddiq chosen? What was the methodology of his choosing? Uh, there are three uh, opinions, if you like, about this issue within Sunni Islam. The first of them is that uh, the Sahaba amongst themselves decided to choose Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. There's nothing from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam whatsoever. And this, some have said this is the majority opinion. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah also seems to, some in some writings, lean to this opinion that the Sahaba amongst themselves thought and talked, and then they chose Abu Bakr. The second opinion, and this is uh, narrated from Al-Hasan al-Basri and others, is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam indirectly indicated that Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa. Indirectly indicated, not directly. And neither was there nothing, which is the first opinion. And, uh, well, let me be precise. The first opinion does not say there was nothing. The first opinion says, no doubt the Prophet ﷺ said that Abu Bakr was the best in terms of his fadl, in terms of his status. But the first opinion would say the Prophet ﷺ did not indicate who should be the political leader after him. Right? All of Sunni Islam agrees that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq is the best Sahabi amongst all of the Sahaba. Right? So the difference comes, how was he chosen to be the Khalifa? Some group will say, the Sahaba realized he was the best, so they chose him to be the Khalifa. The second opinion says, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam subtly indicated that he should be the Khalifa. And then Hassan al-Basr and others indica- uh, uh, held this position. That there's nothing explicit, but neither is it neutral. Rather, there's hints, isharat, that Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa. And the third opinion is what's left now. The Prophet clearly said. And this opinion has also been hinted at by some of the early authorities, and it is also the position of the famous Andalusian scholar Ibn Hazm. Ibn Hazm said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explicitly commanded the Sahaba. It's a command. Right? And this is in exact contradistinction to the Shi'i uh, theology, which is that he commanded Ali to be the Khalifa. That's the Shi'i theology. And Ibn Hazm and others say, no, the exact opposite. He commanded Abu Bakr to be the Khalifa. Right? And this is a minority opinion. Minority opinion, and frankly, uh, I did some research, today. I could not find another name other than Ibn Hazm. It has been narrated, you find it, that some people said, who are these people? 
I could not find anybody other than Ibn Hazm. Maybe there are other people that are saying this is a very small minority opinion that the Prophet explicitly commanded the Sahaba that for example, when I die, the Khalifa should be Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. This is not the majority opinion. The majority opinion is between one and two. The majority opinion is between one and two. And frankly, the two opinions are not mutually exclusive, one and two. One and two are not mutually exclusive. Is that clear? In other words, both of them are valid. Because the first group, what is it saying? They, the first group is saying that the ahadith about Abu Bakr just mention how great of a person he is. And he's the greatest. But then isn't that an indication as well that? That he should be the leader, right? So therefore, in my opinion, really the first and the second opinions are really the same opinion. Which is that the Prophet ﷺ did not explicitly say Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa. But there were enough indications that the Sahaba therefore understood who should be the Khalifa. So you can kind of combine between the two opinions and make it into one opinion. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. And interestingly enough, as time went by, many ulama and many scholars of tafsir and many theologians attempted to derive Quranic evidences for the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, believe it or not. They attempted to derive Quranic evidences for the Khilafah of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an. So much so that the famous uh, Shanqiti, who is the uh, author of Adwa al-Bayan, he actually derived a little bit of a advanced, advanced uh, uh, convoluted uh, evidence from Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. From the first verse of the Quran, he kept on going, 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 till he basically got to the conclusion that, and this verse also indicates the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. So I mean, there are all of these things, but there are some verses that are perhaps a little bit, perhaps more indicative than others. Uh, of them, of course, is the verse that talks about Abu Bakr. What is the verse that talks about Abu Bakr? He's the what? Second in the cave, right? Thani athnaini idhuma fil ghar. Okay? Thani athnaini idhuma fil ghar. So, what is the, how, how can this be used to derive Abu Bakr should be the Khalifa? So, they say, if he is the second of the two, then when the first one is missing, who is left? Abu Bakr. Right? So, Allah says he is the second of the two. So, logically speaking, when the first is not there, the second must come and stand in his place. Right? So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly calls him Thani Athnain, this indicates therefore that when the number one is not there and is missing, uh, passed away, number two will take that place. And frankly, that's not a bad evidence. Okay? It's actually somewhat of a good evidence here. That when Allah says Abu Bakr is the second of the two, therefore, when number one is not there, number two then gets into the place. And in fact, linguistically, what does Khalifa mean? Linguistically, Khalifa means the one who has been appointed to be in charge of. So, Khalifa means to take over when the person leaves. So, when somebody leaves, then the Khalifa comes. So, when Allah says Abu Bakr is Thani Athnain, then in fact, this makes him kind of the Khalifa. Because Khalifa means when the one goes, so the number two uh, comes in. Therefore, this is one opinion. Sorry, one ayah. Another ayah that is used is Surah At-Tawbah, verse 100. Where Allah says, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُهُمْ بِإِحْسَانِ And those who are السَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ The earliest who raced to convert to Islam from the Muhajirun and the Ansar and those who came after them. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically indicating that the earliest converts are the best and they are in order after the Prophet. So after the Prophet, who do you have? As-sabiqoon al-awwaloon min al-muhajirin wal-ansar. The earliest of the batches who raced from and then even there's a tartib, Muhajirun then Ansar. So who is the first adult convert of the Muhajirun? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore is also indicating according to this interpretation that Abu Bakr as-Siddiq should be, uh, should be uh, in, in charge after the process. Now these are the two verses that in my opinion have at least, in my opinion, some, it makes some sense. There are at least seven, eight others that are given that 
frankly, I don't find much substance and it seems more imaginative, such as Alhamdulillah Habil Alameen. He goes through here and there until he gets this. I don't see this as being direct. Uh, but these two, I think, they have some semblance of authenticity that yes, indeed, the Quran is praising Abu Bakr indirectly or directly in the first verse. And from this you can somewhat extract the theological point that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq is the most qualified. Okay, So the Qur'an does seem to have some indication. As for the ahadith, there are so many ahadith about the blessings of Abu Bakr. We can give an entire lecture or two just about those ahadith. But I just want to mention three or four that indicate that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq uh, clearly has a status that the other Sahaba do not have, even when it comes to issues of standing instead of or in place of the Prophet i.e. the Khalifa of the Prophet Because again, what does Khalifa mean? Khalifa means you're standing in place of somebody else. So, what are some of these ahadith? Of the most uh, authentic of and the most explicit is a hadith in Sahih Bukhari itself. That the Prophet is seeing a dream. So he is predicting the future by seeing this dream. And he is saying, while I was sleeping, I saw in a dream that I was standing next to a well. And I pulled from this well, as long as Allah will that I pull. So he is now pulling water. Then Abu Bakr came, and he pulled a bucket or two. And in his pulling was some weakness. It wasn't as strong as mine. There was some weakness in it. Then Umar ibn al-Khattab came. And the bucket became a, and, and the Arabic word is used, which uh, basically means a much larger. So they have different, in English we have bucket. We say small bucket, medium bucket, large bucket. In Arabic, obviously, when you're drawing water from a well, you have so many different nouns to describe the size of the bucket. And the first word used is dalu. And dalu is basically a small canister. Then the next word is used, Umar came, and it became basically the much bigger bucket. The much bigger one that is used for watering uh, camels or something. And so it transformed to this one. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I have never seen an abqari like Umar working with the bucket uh, like anybody else. And Abqari, of course, uh, in modern Arabic means genius. But in classical Arabic, it meant something above and beyond what is natural. Supernatural. Or uh, above normal. So the Prophet called, by the way, for the Arabs here, the Prophet 